from HanselMinutes.com. It's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 343, recorded live Thursday, October 25th, 2012. This episode is brought to you by Telerik, offering the best in developer tools and support. Online at T-E-L-E-R-I-K.com. And by Franklins.net, training developers to work smarter. And now offering Gesture Pack, a powerful gesture recording and recognition system for Microsoft Connect for Windows developers. Details at gesturepak.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Phil Williams, creator of Draw a Stick Man, and John Peppers, lead developer for Apps at HitSense. Hi, this is Scott Hansman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. And today we're talking about mono and cross platform gaming with Phil Williams, the creator of Draw a Stick Man and the new game Draw a Stick Man Epic, along with John Peppers, who's a lead developer at HitSense for apps. Thanks, guys, for uh, talking to me. Thanks for having us on. So, Phil, if I remember correctly, Draw a Stick Man was something that was on the web a couple of maybe a year ago, 2011. It was an HTML5 game. Yes, that's correct. Uh, I designed it uh, a little over a year ago, and we launched it about about a year ago. Um, and it, it initially was just a website. Um, it was an interactive web game. Um, and we wrote it all using uh, JavaScript and SVG um, to do all the graphics. And uh, it's a, just a five-minute animated game, uh, but it went viral, and we had millions and millions of views in a very short period of time. And you wrote this in HTML5 while just a couple of, I don't know, weeks ago, people are saying HTML5 is not ready to do anything. Well, actually, I looked into doing HTML5, um, and most people who look at the site think it's HTML5. It's actually written using SVG and VML. Um, Wow. Wow. To do the graphics, um, and that way it will run on very old browsers. Um, and I did that just because a year ago HTML5 really wasn't widespread enough uh, to really seem like that was going to be a, an option that uh, the majority of our users would be able to play. So it, it is really neat because I mean it doesn't use any plugins at all, and it'll run on pretty much any browser. Crazy. Okay, so let's just make sure that folks understand. When I say HTML5, people usually think about CSS, a certain level of JavaScript support, Canvas, which is the ability to slap pixels up on the screen, and you used SVG, Scalable Vector Graphics, and and VML, Vector Markup Language, for for IE, and then you manipulated those vectors with JavaScript? That's exactly right. Yes, and the the extra level of complexity on top of that, um, I knew to be able to do that kind of animation, I was going to need some kind of design tool. So I actually wrote a program that would take flash animation and convert it into a, into a format, into a JSON format that I could then read in and animate using vectors uh, in SVG and VML. So I actually created the initial animation in flash uh, and then it ran it through a lot of conversion to make it all happen. Oh, that's clever, because I was immediately thinking, you know, SVG is one of these technologies that everyone loves to talk about how wonderful it is. But then when you say, well, show me the really great SVG editor that you're using, uh, they always say, well, I write it in Illustrator, and then I export it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that, that's the big problem. Um, to, to develop something with that much animation, you have to have some kind of development tool. Um, and that's why... I, I had to write this conversion program to begin with. Okay, so break it down for me. I have my kids play it, but I want to understand. Let's talk about like the, the general concept behind Stickman, and then we'll dig into the tech. Okay, so you go to this website, and it asks you to draw a Stickman. And so you draw this Stickman, and then he comes to life, and he starts going on this adventure, and he, he starts walking across the screen and asking you to draw various things to help him in this adventure. So he'll ask you to draw a key to open a box and he eventually fights a dragon and you have to draw a sword um and it just has a lot of different surprises but the the fascinating thing about it is that the objects you draw the sick man will use in this kind of lifelike manner um and he'll actually move around so so the neat thing is seeing your drawings come to life through this adventure 
I, I play this with my kids and, uh, it's funny because I was completely blown away because they, you know, they, they draw a man and then his feet start moving and he starts walking around and, you know, I'm freaking out and they're like, yeah, you know, that's, of course, that's how it should work. <laughs> yeah, it's been neat seeing the different reaction of different people. Um, we, we definitely get from, from, uh, from developers, we really get this fascination with how, how did it happen? How did you actually do this kind of thing? Um, from more artsy type people, they're they're more saying, well, that that is how it should work. But they're really excited about it because it's sort of their dream come true. This is this is the way life should be, where you can draw things and they come to life. But then that we really never even designed it for kids. Um, but we have a huge following, of course, with kids because it it's something that the kids love to do, just to be able to draw things and see them come to life. So it's really become a huge market for us. Uh, even though it's never what we had in mind to begin with. Do you think this is a, is this a game for adults? I mean, like I, I always think it's funny that we have all of these like 30 year old, 35 year old professionals playing angry birds. And it seems to me like it's a game for 12 year olds, but then it starts to ratchet up the, the difficulty. And then I realize that I'm not smart enough to play angry birds. Uh, is, is this, does Epic stick man get pretty or stick man Epic rather get pretty um, hardcore towards the end there, or is it all very accessible? It does get pretty difficult towards the end. Um, we did design it with, with adults in mind. Um, we believe it will have a, a big appeal to kids, um, but we did actually design it more as a, as a game for adults. Um, so that, that's kind of our, our target market. So when you have a game that is, that is vectors and SVGs, and I assume that is there some bitmap, like when he's walking around in the forest, is that a big giant PNG and then you're just floating that around, or is that also v, uh, SVG? That's correct. It's, uh, it is a, a bitmap image. Um, on, mm-hmm. on the website, the stuff that you draw will, is vectors, but everything else is actually PNG images, and we did that for performance. Um, mm-hmm. You can obviously draw a PNG to the screen much faster than you can draw a series of vector lines. Um, and there's so, really no so, need to display anything else in vectors besides the stick man and the objects that you draw. This would be interesting if it were just a website. And and you can go to Draw a Stick Man and, and learn about it. But what I think is interesting, why I wanted to have you on the phone and, and, and John Peppers, who's been so kind as to uh, sit quietly for a moment here, is that if you go to, you know, um, epic.drawstickman.com and scroll down a little bit, it says devices and it says iPhone, iPad, Android, Android tablet, Windows 8 desktop, Windows 8 tablet. You've got this running everywhere. And that went from being, oh, interesting. He's written something in HTML 4.9, which, which I'm gonna, I've just decided to call that what you did, HTML 4.9, by the way. We'll see if we can make that catch on, drawing everything in SVG <laughs> and VML. It's just one one smaller than HTML5. You've now ported it over basically everywhere, so you're actually going to you've you've launched on Windows 8 and iPhone at the exact same time, which seems impossible to me. You you reached yeah. out to John, or do you work at the same company? We work at the same company, and uh, my department we've been using Xamarin products for a while, so MonoTouch mm-hmm. and Mono for Android. Um, and so we were pretty familiar with mobile platforms and using C Sharp and you know, creating cross-platform apps. And so our first step was to take you know, Phil's workflow where he can design things in Flash and export it and then write a quick little C Sharp game engine that loads that up and then can animate everything. Um, so he's got the same, same workflow he had before, but you know, we have several animators and designers who can lay out levels they can animate enemies to walk around, even lay out positions where uh, here's where this enemy can get hurt or here's where this enemy can hurt your stick man and so forth. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's the gist of how it works. Uh, okay. I'm trying to break down in my mind, like, of course, whenever you see a game and you're a programmer, you're trying to, like, write it in your head as you look at it. So you've got, you've got stick man. And I'm imagining that he's in a rectangle and that there's a mesh applied to him that indicates how you're going to distort him to make it look like he's walking around. Yes, and, and it's kind of interesting how we animate drawings in the new game. Um, what Phil does is he lays out a, a 100 by 100 square in Flash. And what we do is we treat that as a percentage. 
to apply to all the points within the drawing. So he has a nice little fire animation, and it kind of distorts to kind of look like a fire flickering. And the stick man's walk is the same way. So you apply that over. So you take it. You take the vector, and you out. You know, you, are you are you turning it into a raster? Or are you doing everything as a vector, even manipulating it in memory as a vector? Um, yeah, in the game, it is yeah, just basically a list of vectors, and we kind of draw lines between each point. Uh, and so that list of vectors, we we apply this distortion every frame as defined in Flash. Uh, and so that gives him the whole walking animation. In addition to some, we might have some other manual code tweaks to make him look better, but that's that's the gist of it. So then there's other things that you draw, and since you know what the user's going to draw, you're kind of taking a guess as to, you know, I hope that their stick man looks human. Like if I drew a stick man that looked like a horse, it might move kind of weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there is an algorithm to find his feet and his hands which um, is, is all done in C-sharp. That's not something on the design end, but uh, mm-hmm. it, it seems to work pretty well as long as you don't draw something very strange. <laughs> I think that the negative testing would be an interesting, uh, <laughs> an interesting thing to experiment with in this game. Right, right. So then he's walking around against these PNGs, but he can't walk through trees. Are you keeping track of the positions of all the different obstacles to make sure that he's, even though he's walking up on a bitmap, uh, you've got a path laid out for him? That's correct. So in, in, the, in the flash portion of, of designing the game, let's say they're creating a tree. Um, they'll have, uh, here's a state when the tree is about to burn, or here's a state where the tree's normal. Um, in each of those states, there's a, a list of collision boxes that get applied with any enemy or, it, or the player or, you know, so forth. Um, and, it, and enemies will also have other things like that will, they move this far on this frame and that, that kind of thing. Do, do things ever get out of sync? You've got the flash animations, you've got the SVG generated stuff, you've got all of this feeding from his original animations and now into a cross-platform game written in C-sharp, how, how do you keep things in sync both from an engine's perspective and from a behavioral perspective and an artistic one? Well, uh, we all use the same source control repository, which I think helps that we have that. Um, so even the designers, you know, they save their Flash projects in there. And then at some point when they decide it's ready, they, they'll export that in, in our format, and that gets committed as well. And so when we make a build, it is kind of a big deal. We have to make sure, oh, we got everything, the latest everything. We have to play through every level, make sure everything's okay. So I know down the road, updates are going to be interesting. We'll have to see how that goes. Did you take existing frameworks to go and write this? I mean, we hear about Mono, and those of us who who have played with it uh, like it, but I don't think that uh, it's obvious maybe to the listener, how they would suddenly start writing a game in Mono. They might be familiar with things like the XNA framework, but right. how does Mono enable me to write a game that runs anywhere? Well, we have uh, uh, taken advantage of an open source project called Mono Game. And what it is is basically uh, the XNA APIs, but implemented on all the platforms. So on iOS, um, they have... The, they provide this XNA API, but under the hood, it runs OpenGL. Um, and so for Windows 8, for example, um, they provided an XNA implementation, even though Microsoft hasn't. So, you know, they've kind of implemented XNA to work for Metro, WinRT, which is nice. But the implication is that uh, you could write an XNA game on Windows and very quickly you know, port that game to iOS. And you might have to change how input works or, or tweak a few things, but for the most part, it is a very straightforward port to different platforms. So does this mean that, that this is a series of interfaces I can count on or a series of classes that I can count on being there and I just change namespaces, or is it a matter of just swapping references out? Well, it's not even a change of namespaces. Um, in XNA, you have a game class Right batch class, and uh, those are kind of the building blocks, along with 
you know, Vector2 and some other objects. Um, but those are implemented exactly the same as Microsoft did for XNA. Uh, so you can expect everything to work the same, and the APIs are the same. So that's, that's really what gets you the power to go cross-platform, because you don't have to rewrite any code other than you know, input or minor things like how you save your game files and so forth. Hey, this is Scott, and I am really excited about these guys. Uh, this is a special offer from our friends at DN Simple. True story, uh, Carl reached out to DN Simple to ask them if they wanted to advertise with Hansel Minutes because we like them that much. It was a kind of a funny thing. They didn't come to us. We went to them because we think DN Simple is great. It's a hosted DNS service that you use to manage your domain names. Prices start at about $3 a month for up to 10 managed domains. Um, you can also use DN Simple to register domain names, purchase SSL certificates. All of my domains have been moved off of GoDaddy and are now at DN Simple. I like it because there's an application on my iPhone. I can manage my DNS from there. There's an API that you can use. The best part, actually, is these one-click services. So you can register a domain, get it up and running in a couple of minutes, and then go in and apply services to it. So you can say, this domain is for Google Apps, and this domain is for GitHub Pages, and this domain is for Posturus. And they know the DNS records and set them up for you. Even for something as complicated as Google Apps, there's like 11 different settings you need to create. They handle it all for you. So here's the deal. They've got a special 30-day trial. You can cancel at any time, but Hansel Minutes listeners get three months of free DNS service. So you go to dnsimple.com slash hm. Special deal for Hansel Minutes listeners. Just visit dnsimple.com slash hm. Hansel Minutes listeners get three months of free DNS service. Love these guys. They're so nice. DN Simple. Hosted DNS. Check them out. So this reminds me of of Wine and the idea behind Wine. The uh, Wine is not an emulator. It's the Windows uh, kind of thunking layer over uh, for for Linux. So you can run some Windows applications on uh, you know unchanged on a Linux machine because it translates at real time. You know the calls that a Win32 developer would make into an appropriate Linux call. So you're saying that you're making XNA and DirectX calls, and it's translating them into OpenGL? Yeah, that's correct. And so, you know, they, they of course, Monogame has, you know, a wide range of, of code changes between each platform, but they provide the same API uh, to the developer using Monogame, which, which is amazing. How much code are you able to reuse? I've heard people writing... Um, you know, what I call text boxes over data type business applications in, in, in mono and going from platform to platform. And they, they always talk about reusing the view model, which is kind of the lowest common denominator. You know, here's a bunch of structures. I can reuse those. So you might get 20, 30 percent reuse. But what kind of reuse are you guys getting? Because you have a lot of platforms to, to support. Right. We're actually getting around 95 percent. Um, and the, the differing code is are things like, Oh, uh, we have a, a upgrade to pro button here, so the link is different. Or, you know, on iOS, we, we save the game in a completely different place than on, uh, uh, WinRT, for example. Um, and so, like, if, if it was just a regular Windows app, we might save the game in my documents or someplace, you know, you would expect. Well, iOS has a, a built-in way to save settings for apps, so we want to take advantage of that where we can. Um, it also backs up to iCloud that way. Seems almost impossible. If I, if do I, can I look at this in Visual Studio and I would see a solution explorer with like a core engine that is like a, a for lack of a better phrase, a portable library, a mono library, and then the rest of it would be targets. Well, it's it's a little more complicated. Um, there is a core library, and then for each platform, there is a uh, a project to run the game in that platform. Um, but we do have we have to duplicate the core library and kind of link in the different files. So you know, like we might have an an XNA one where all the files are actually kept. Well, the iOS one would have the core library and and link to all the files. Um, that way, you don't commit the file multiple times, and you can 
you can use uh, preprocessor statements to do things on different platforms if you need to, which for the most part, it hasn't been, we haven't had to do that a whole lot. So this is not binary reuse in the sense of I compiled the stickman.core and everyone just talks to that DLL. This is, it's source level reuse. It's still 95%, but this allows you to kind of if def your way around things. And part of the reason for that is uh, on iOS, Monotouch actually um, compiles down the same way an Objective-C app would. Uh, so you can't use a straight .NET library just on iOS. You, you do need to recompile it. Uh, but some of the other platforms would be able to reuse it, like if it was just a Windows, standard Windows app, um, it could reference the uh, WinRT library, for example. There was a conference uh, a couple weeks ago that uh, used to be called Monospace and was renamed to Monkey Space. Uh, and it's, it's, an, it's a cross-platform, an open-source .NET conference. And um, it's, it's organized by a nonprofit called Monkey Square. And in an in interest of full disclosure, I'm on the board of uh, the Monkey Square nonprofit organization, um, which is not related to why you guys are on the show. It's a coincidence. At Monkey Space, Miguel de Casa said he thought it was really cool that C Sharp is basically the only only language that lets you target all the app stores. And I thought, what a, what a good quote and what a what a strong statement. What do you what do you think about that? The idea that this language is how you target every app store that is out there. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, uh, even in just making like a line of business application, you can. Like we've been able to reuse around fifty percent of the code. Uh, you know that uh, that is all dependent on how many, you know, how complicated your UI is, because you do have to reuse, rewrite the UI on each platform. But um, using C Sharp, I mean, you can share so much code, and and every line of code that is shared, you don't have to write three times, because uh, you know every day we we have a new platform coming out. We have Windows 8, uh, Metro, we have desktop apps, uh, we have Android, iOS, and, and who knows down the road what will happen. So. When, when you're writing a game, you're, throwing, you're kind of throwing pixels up on a screen, so really screen size, I think, would be the hardest. Once you've got the pixel on the screen, it's really just a matter of dealing with, with screen size. With a business app, you, know, you really kind of are rewriting this, the, the UI. You don't want to write something... And you can't really write a UI that would look the same on an iPad versus an Android unless you were using some cross-platform uh, set of widgets. Otherwise, then you're, right. you're back in the Java days where you, you write it once and it looks like Java everywhere. Right. So you want to be able to take advantage uh, of the, the native uh, controls that each platform supports. So mm -hmm. on iOS, you want to use all the UI kit controls, the nice table views and buttons and everything that feels like iOS. But you want to do that on Android as well. So um, I think this really is the best, C Sharp is the best solution for using native controls and sharing code at the same time. Do, do you know of any other um, game developers in your kind of like, I assume you guys all hang out, like I, I imagine it's like Top Gun, and then after work you all go to the, the game developer bar and you hang out with all the other game developers and then... Like there, there's like the Iceman and there's Goose and everybody and uh, do do you talk to these other game developers and they go hey you guys are using C sharp you bunch of putzes. <laughs> well, uh, we are traditionally just a uh, custom software company here, um, so this is our first you know foray into gaming. Uh, now we do we do talk a, w a lot with the Xamarin guys, um, but that is. They're not necessarily game developers, so you know, I don't know if we really have uh, heard much from guys saying, "Oh, you got to do it in, in C plus plus," or "How can you make a game in C sharp?" We haven't really um, met anyone who had that opinion yet. So. Well, I understand that that there's a lot of push towards doing C plus plus, and that that Windows eight has a renewed. Um, uh, I don't know, it has renewed interest in native development, and uh, they're making you know making C plus plus more accessible. And I wonder if 
given that you've got Objective C on the iOS devices, how are people porting all these games from place to place? You know, I'm kind of imagining in my mind, like, okay, so someone wrote Angry Birds in iOS, and now it's on, uh, on now it's on Windows. That's going to be you know, somebody rewrote that thing. Well, right. you guys are going to be able to move faster, I assume, and even add levels to your stuff in a pretty easy, pretty easy way. Right. Yeah, I think traditional games they do have to rewrite most of the game on each platform. Like, I think some of them do take advantage of scripting. Like, they might use Lua, for example, to script mm-hmm. some of the the logic and the levels and so forth. But they would still have to rewrite the engine for each platform. Uh, so they would have a Java one on Android and an Objective C one on iOS, and it, it it is a lot of work to go that route. Yeah, it does seem like that idea of a core engine that speaks a scripting language kind of started with that uh, Scum, S-C-U-M-M, uh, LucasArts kind of style, and um, things like King's Quest, where you've got all of these assets, and then you've got this core engine, and then you want to make it really easy to describe interactions. Do you have any other languages other than C Sharp in the application? Uh, it's just C Sharp. If if you would consider everything we define in Flash as a language, um, it is it is more of like a big blob of data, like you know, it's a resource, an thing. asset. Right, right. Uh, but yeah, C Sharp is really the only language we're having to use. Down the road, we might consider writing a JavaScript engine. Um, to just run this game in the browser normally, uh, which that is definitely a possibility. So the separation, is that clear? Like you could have the asset blob and then have an engine bring that down and it could conceivably start using Canvas rather than XNA. Yeah, that's correct. When, when you guys were working on, on, on Windows, and this is just my own curiosity because I, I, I have an Android, well, I don't have an Android, I have an HP touchpad that I rooted. I have an iPad, so I'm familiar with Android, I'm familiar with iOS. I'm just now getting familiar with Windows 8. Uh, I've done a couple of videos on how to use it and stuff, but I don't know a lot about it from a gaming perspective. And I've heard that people say when you're in full screen, you know, when you're in a Windows Store app rather than a desktop app, there's concern about not having the ability to do certain things, like you're in some kind of a sandbox. Did you have to bump up against any ideas like any issues like that, any... any um security or sandboxing issues where you wanted to do something but it simply wasn't available in the API? Yeah, for the most part, you know, this game doesn't do anything to your system as far as you know, needing to, you know, interact with your desktop. So, you know, the only thing that is persistent is saving your save game. And mm-hmm. there is there are clear APIs for saving files in, in a, a Windows Store app. So that that would be uh, code that we'd have to rewrite just the act of saving our, our save game mm-hmm. uh, against a desktop app, which we would just save a file somewhere, basically. Uh, you mentioned iCloud, had, though. Do you save to iCloud on iPad so that I can move between iPhone and iPad and have my level maintained? Yes. There uh, is a standard settings API that uh, every app can take advantage of on iOS. And so we just kind of stuff your save game information into the iOS settings, which is kind of backed up by iCloud and so forth. Is it is it backed up by iCloud? The reason I ask is that like Angry Birds is like the most popular app on the planet, except I have to keep restarting it every time I move to a new device. I wonder if I could move, if, if there was a world where I could move amongst all of these devices and have my game stay the same. I think that's possible. Um, the way our game is implemented, I don't, I'm not sure if your save game would pull over just like Angry Birds. But um, It'd be a cool... Well, the Angry Birds doesn't do it. That's why I'm angry about it. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> well, I don't think I'm we're doing it either. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty upset but, about it, actually. Um, so uh, I could save... Uh, so on, like, on Windows 8, could I save in the, my save game in, the, uh, in SkyDrive in a cloud? Yeah, I think theoretically you could. I, I think that's something... Uh, we have to add as a feature to the game. I don't mm-hmm. think there's a straightforward API for doing that. Um, but, you know, I, I certainly think that's a, a great idea. Yeah, absolutely. So what what's next for you guys? Are you going to create like a, I mean, you know, Phil had this great idea and you guys have put it together with this great team. 
now it, it seems to me like it's it's time to go kind of little big planet and start letting me draw my own level and then share it with my friend. Right. We we've kind of been tossing around ideas like that. We've we've also mm-hmm. talked about going 3D as far as um, you know having everything have a 3D look. Maybe the world is still 2D, but you know adding adding some depth to the game. Mm-hmm. Like a flat land, a little 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 one dimension, two dimensional guy finds himself right, in, a, or, in the big big world. Or Paper Mario, that's a good example. It, it plays around with dimensions in that game. So um, we talked about that. Phil, do you have any other ideas? No? Yeah, we have. Um, we've had. We really have talked quite a bit about letting the player design more of their world and interact more with it, and that's really a direction we le- we would like to go. Um, Especially because the the stickman concept just really lends itself to creation. That's kind of what it's all about. So that's really a direction that we've we've kind of been talking about for, especially the last couple of weeks after we finished up this game. We've been kind of talking about what where to go next, and that's been a big discussion point. I think what's great about it from a gaming from from not from, from a gaming perspective, but from an accessibility perspective, is that it's not intimidating. Like, there's no judgment. You draw a stick man, everyone can draw a stick man, and then you don't drop him into a world where everything is, you know, perfect 3D rendered art. You know what I mean? It's like, it feels like other people drew stick men too. You know, some of the art is sophisticated, like the monster. Some is pretty basic, like rocks and things. And uh, you, you don't feel like you're being judged as an artist. So I like the idea of being able to either have multiplayer stick man, where you could have your friends run around in there. I mean, the, you really could go and do a lot of stuff. You've got the whole, like the Sims, you know, the Stickman version of the Sims. There's a lot of really fun things you could do. And being able to do it across devices is even better. If I could play on my Windows 8 machine while my kids are simultaneously on my iPad, that would be fun. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think those are definitely directions that we we uh, we want to go into, and they're definitely directions that we're researching and looking at right now. Um, I think the multiplayer, there's a huge amount of opportunity. The neat thing about this is it's just such a unique concept that everyone we talk to has has all sorts of visions for it just because it is such a creative thing that a lot of people have just never really thought about or seen before. Mm-hmm. Was it important to you to get this on as many devices as possible? I mean, a lot of popular games started on iPhone or iPad and then we waited a year or two as they moved their way around, Angry Birds being the obvious example. But you're launching on everything all the time right off the bat. Was that important? Like, did you say, I want it everywhere? Um, yeah, that, that has been a big thing with this game. Um, when we previously launched our, uh, we created some iOS apps that basically just showed the, uh, the Stickman website um, in an app. And we just had it on iOS. And we showed that at the South by Southwest uh, conference last year, or the beginning of this year, and we had a, a huge number of people ask us why we hadn't developed it for Android, and so that was really, that's when we started really thinking about, okay, we need to make a new game, and we need to make it where it's going to be on all the platforms, because that's that's what the customers want. So that's that was one of our biggest goals when we started making this game. Did, did you talk to the Microsoft guys at all, or work with them? Was it important to be on Windows 8 at launch time? Yeah, we actually did. Uh, we were reached out by uh, uh, a developer group in, in Chicago. Who, they're kind of close to where we are, but um, basically they wanted to see if it was possible to get this game on you know, launch day for Windows 8. And you know, they've helped us out as far as you know, making sure we're ready for the store, uh, assisted maybe with some design ideas, but... Uh, you know, there there are a few things in Windows 8 that you might consider taking advantage of, like you know, there's a an app bar that pops out from the side and so forth. Um, but, you know, they they have helped us in getting ready for Windows 8. So you're available now in the in the store. People can go up and check you out and download you now. Is there a, is there a trial or what's the initial pricing? Um, there are two versions of the game. There's a, a free version with three levels, and it, it, does, it is ad-supported. Um, but then the the full version uh, has 14 levels and no ads or anything. Um, and the the full version is 99 cents for iPhone, but then like Windows 8 and iPad, it's a dollar 99. 
and that that's our, our starting very cool well that's so great i wish you guys all the best this is exciting and i'm hearing kind of underneath all of this you're saying it's ready to go mono game is something that we could start doing absolutely right now that's correct for sure well all the best to you guys and folks can check this out at epic.drawstickman.com i'm sure that they can google their brains out for draw stickman because you guys are taking over the world on every platform available thanks for chatting with me right this has been another episode of handsome minutes and we'll see you again next week (laughs) 